Lord God, we thank you for an opportunity to do this. We thank you for um, the means living in the age that we live in to communicate with a vast audience like this. And we pray that you would ordain that the right people would see this video and that they would be encouraged by it, and challenged by it, that it would draw them to Trinity, that they might be mentored and discipled and grow in their love for you. Um, and we also pray that it would lead them to local community nearby them where their hearts can be cared for. And they can lay their lives down serving others and blessing others through fellowship. Um, Lord, just guide what we say. Let it be glorifying and honoring to you. And we pray that you would bear fruit from it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. My name is Monica Evans. I am in Arizona. I am a mom of two teenagers, happily married thus far, and happily doesn't mean without uh, challenges. I, I am with Trinity International, a mentor, and today we're going to have this round table about finding Christian community. Today, our, today's panelists are Grady from Arizona, EJ from Ohio, and Michelle from Canada. Uh, if you could please um, share, and we're going to start with Michelle first, then EJ, and at the end, Grady. And Michelle, if uh, we can start with, uh, what is your favorite thing to do in your spare time? Um, the second thing, what do, you, what do you do for Trinity or with Trinity? And third, maybe tell us something interesting about you. Uh, so, what I like to do on my free time is that I like to kickbox. I've been taking kickboxing classes for self-defense okay. and I, I like it for like doing exercise and learning new things and meeting new people. Um, what I do for Trinity is that I'm a mentee and I've been a mentee for a year and a half. Uh, something interesting about me is that I love to, I love school. I love studying. I love learning new things and stuff like that. So, uh, <clears throat> What I like to do in my free time, and I apologize to everybody for this upper respiratory infection or whatever it is that I have, but um, in my spare time, I like to uh, uh, do living history as my hobby. So um, I helped to start a group that we reenact the Second World War. And so a lot of my spare time goes into that because it's a pretty labor intensive organization. Um, and then <clears throat> what I uh, do for living, um, like I think I said earlier, uh, basically just history and two different jobs. So I work for um, the History Center here in Ohio, and um, I work as a historian in a forensic psychology office. So I get to see everybody before they see their doctor. It's basically mental health triage. And then... Um, Something interesting. I don't have anything for you on that one. Pretty boring guy. <laughs> no, you, have, you do reenactments. I think that's pretty interesting. I don't so. see that every day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, EJ. What about you, Grady? Uh, well, my name is Grady. I, I live in Arizona. And uh, what I enjoy for my free time would probably be hanging out with my wife and my four kids uh we like playing board games together um so if i have free time that's a fun way for me to spend it for trinity i am a mentor and um really enjoy that process and something interesting um i don't know i like reading books maybe that's boring but i find it interesting yeah that's interesting well thank you so much for introducing um yourself and since we're talking about finding a Christian community let's go ahead and define the word community well I, I looked up a dictionary definition for community um, and it's a group that shares common characteristics or interests and it perceives itself as unique from others around it I don't know is that too boring that I pulled the dictionary definition <laughs> no no I actually was looking for a definition as well. And I think uh, I actually Googled it. So I think I may have had the same answer. Um, would you all of you agree with that definition of community or if there is something else that you would like to add to that? I think that's pretty spot on, to be honest. 
I think it's a, I think it's a really good definition, but I think maybe a, a good way to illustrate that definition would be, you know, as I'm thinking about, you know, in the Bible, for, for example, at one point, you know, there's that whole bit in Ephesians where Paul talks about the armor. Well, we know the armor comes from him being around Roman soldiers. Well, one of the things that, you know, as historians that we can look at is, for example, with the Roman military, every legion had its own culture. You could even say a legion was its own community. They had their own name. They had their own, um, oftentimes that each legion had its own different type of shield that was paid in different ways to identify them. And they had, you know, an identity within that legion. And I think that, you know, we as Christians and our different, you know, analogy would be the legions or maybe different churches or different ministries were involved in, you know, in, in every one of those different things, we each have our own flavor, our own identity. Not every church is the same. Not every ministry is the same. You know, Trinity is its own distinct, you know, community. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, it's tough because if you take community on a broad sense, like like I said, I like playing board games. So there's a whole like board game community, but that includes tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people spread potentially around the world, right? Then you can shrink it down to like a more localized, I've got a group of friends that I enjoy playing board games with. And that's a whole nother like level of community. So you know, community has either very broad, uh, loose associations or very narrow, close associations. Um, the closer you get, probably the more community gets defined, something more like friendship, maybe. Yeah, but I think it's I see. A, Go ahead, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say, it's a group of people that share something in common and see themselves as distinct from other people. Yeah, I think that's important to, to mention because in today's environment, like there are so many communities and nowadays we have even internet communities. Um, and in the definition that was written about is about people living in the same place. And nowadays, like if we are using internet communities or the community um, of games that you mentioned, Grady, like there are people from different like cultures or countries or cities, et cetera. So I think it's, that is uh, good to remember. So now, uh, what is a Christian community then? I, I think, sorry to go first, but this is kind of like my deal because I'm a pastor. Um, <laughs> Christian community is community that is centralized around Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's a community where the people have in common the most significant thing, which is they are all connected to Christ. He's sort of the nucleus of that. They have a shared obsession with Jesus. Yeah. Feel, free to, else? feel free to rip me a new one and tear that to pieces if you disagree. I would just add on to saying that it's like also, as he's saying, people that love Jesus, people who are with the spirit and also people who want to be in fellowship in one way. Fellowship mm -hmm. can be in maybe in a congregation like church or in small groups or worshiping like worship nights youth groups, mentee, mentor things as we're doing right here in Trinity. Uh, I think that would be it. Or even just hanging out with other Christians as well. Like even if I think I would call like, if I'm hanging out with my Christian girlfriends, I would call that fellowship because in this, in the end, even though we talk about commonalities, that girly things, we might also talk about like Jesus and the Bible and the, our theology on that, like our theology, or even just be certain like, Walk, whacking up like a little mini Bible study there too. So I would, that's what I would call a Christian community. It could be a small amount of people and it could be tons and expand to like a big community in a sense. Right. Go ahead, Adrian. Well, I was going to say, I think another thing that at least with good Christian community that I think sets us apart from a lot of other, you know, communities in the secular world is that, um, because of our mutual love for Jesus, it, it is one of the most unifying communities. You know, for example, here in America, we're starting to see a resurgence in the idea that we should have segregated campuses, that we should have segregated graduations, that, that skin color 
or ethnic origin should be what defines you whereas the bible you know and in most churches it's pretty pretty clear we don't care what you look like or where you're from if you love jesus that's what we care about we want you here and, and you know i don't look at you know anybody any differently than anybody else in the church because we're all you know the the common thing is love for jesus and character not anything else so i think that's an important thing to note yeah if i can tag on to that uh christian community is it has unity, but not uniformity. And I think this is really beautiful because a lot of communities, um, the expectation is for uniformity. Let's just say a community of people that like the same kinds of clothes. Let's just take something like, you know, the goth community. You can pick them out because they all look the same, right? They have sort of a uniformity in the way that they appear. Mm -hmm. But you can walk into a church and there can be 150 people in there and there's not a, a, a uniformity, but there is a unity, right? So the unity that we have in Jesus, the kind of community that we share, it crosses gender lines, racial lines, ethnic lines. It crosses lines of interest and economic status. Um, that's a really unique thing, I think. Well, I, I think maybe to add on to that, you know, one of the things I think about is, you know, my church that I go to, myself and a couple of the other guys prefer to wear a tie and a sport coat to Sunday morning service. Some people wear jeans and a t-shirt. Some people wear sweatpants, but nobody cares because we're all there to do the same thing. So, you know, who cares? <laughs> That's good. I like that. Yeah, I think it's very important to make that distinction between unity and uniformity. And in the Christian community, I will agree that the common denominator is Christ, where everything else melts away. Uh, in my case, I have uh, an accent and, you know, I am from Peru, yet my alliance is to Christ first and foremost. Um, my main language, although I speak Spanish and I speak English, is to go ahead and share uh, God's news his good news everywhere I go. And so I think in that we have the same, right? For the four of us and to those who claim Christ, I think we have that in common where you no longer uh, look at my, the, the color of my, of my skin or like, uh, not necessarily like we see it, but it's not like, oh, okay, therefore you are either less or more or whatever. That doesn't exist in, in a Christian community. So yeah. I think that that is important too. Real quick, I thought that this was kind of interesting. So looking this up in scripture, I mean, I think one of the best uh, descriptions of community that is Christian is found in Romans 12, starting in verse nine. But the, the New Testament, at least like in Greek, doesn't really have the word community. Instead, it uses the word fellowship, which is mm -hmm. the Greek word koinonia. And I mean, there's some just like semantics here in talking about the difference between these two words, but fellowship has more of like a shared participation. And scripture is very clear that what Christians participate in together is the body and blood of Christ, and it is the Holy Spirit. Uh, I think, Michelle, you were mentioning that earlier, the importance that the Holy Spirit is something that unifies us. So I thought that that was kind of interesting that the word community, which is like a really important kind of catch word in our culture, doesn't actually show up in the Bible. Because what the Bible offers through fellowship is really unique. It's not, a, not like anything that the world has to offer. And again, I mean, you know, what's really the difference between fellowship and community? Maybe there's not too much difference, but that idea of participation is pretty significant, I think. Actually, I would say that fellowship is, is like a deeper word because when we're in fellowship, it's like, it's almost this sense of like relief because I can go ahead and share in the body of Christ my joys as well as my sorrows. And we know that we're going to find encouragement um, through the word of God. Um, and the word of God is alive. And you know what I mean? So that is a huge difference because if I go ahead and talk about other type of communities, um, I may talk about, I don't know, let's say sex is my main thing. So all I talk is about that. 
I, I, maybe nothing else. If, it, if it's about games, all I'm going to talk is about games. So to a certain extent, it's very secluded to only certain things versus in fellowship, um, I'm able to come as I am, but I'm not going to be left as I am. Mm. There's going to be a transformation there. And it's only the transformation to the Holy Spirit and to, to Christ and through fellowship, which is like the gathering of brothers and sisters who have the same like um, goal and is to proclaim Christ and to glorify who he is. There's an intimacy that comes with yes. fellowship that's absence, I think, in community. Yes. I like that word, intimacy. You're good with words, Grady. Someone said that. And I was like, yeah, I think he is. But now you are confirming that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now we talk about like the definition of community, um, Christian community. And we're um, basically mentioning this word fellowship and intimacy comes with fellowship. So now, why is it so hard to find a Christian community? Um, yes. So why do you think it's um, hard? There is a, well, of course, I think we need to take into consideration our current social political context and to the context of conservative Christians on campus. And let's remember that this is mainly for um, conservative Christians who are on campus or those who support them. So why is it so difficult to find a Christian community? Uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, could I? Oh, Michelle, you go first. Okay, uh, mine's a bit of a long answer in the sense of it's like, in the sense of like a social protocol, I would say more, I'd expand into most, a ph philosophical uh, context in the mm -hmm. sense that we've kind of gone into like the, our philosophy used to be of more of a Christian philosophy. They would look into like say Augustine, we look into like all these other like the the church fathers in a sense to find and after we look into the Bible too, to be looking into what our worldview would be. But in like past couple hundred years, we've gone down to we're looking into more the philosophy, let's say from Kierkegaard, where we look at the separation of rational um of logic and truth, and that pretty much separates us, saying that like, hey. There's an absolute separation from the rational and logical form of God. You go down to Kant that says it's like it's we, the concept of freedom can't exist if we have God because God's going to be kind of tangling us up. And we go down to like even Nietzsche that says God's dead. But what's the point? And we go down, down, down more into postmodernism in a sense that it's like everything's subjective. There's no objectivity, which Christianity has. It's very objective that we know Jesus Christ is true. We know that God is real and we go through it and how do we know through what we learn in the text in the bible and from there it's like the universities and the colleges that we go to aren't showing that christian worldview they're showing the secular worldview the postmodernist worldview which says that that separates um god from everything every aspect of we learn in and every aspect that we, we live in and trying to make it into something rational but without including the most important thing which is god mm -hmm. So I and the and the sad thing is that I'm noticing on campus that there's a lot of Christians that if they do show that they're Christian and you do talk I can only talk about in the Canadian context they do talk out or even have like a vibe like I would say people say I have a vibe of being a Christian even if I don't say I am they get segregated from this is the community of the university community they get segregated from the professors it's really hard to find friends there so it's really lonely in a sense there. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would I would say, you know, <laughs> one of the there's a movie line that comes to my head when it comes to being a conservative Christian in academia today, which is run silent, run deep, because there is no, especially at least here in the United States, most of your major schools, you know, I think at this point are acting in a, in a very subliminal way against us in the sense that, you know, if you're going to present a conservative or a Christian, you know, view in your academics, they're going to subtly work against you, make it harder for you to get your degree, make it harder for you to do certain things that, you know, for example, um, you know, you're looking for scholarships, there's plenty of scholarships for 
LGBTQ whatever plus students as well as you know there's a lot of scholarships based solely upon ethnicity this that and anything else but try finding a scholarship for being a Christian mm. it's it's extremely difficult because they don't want to encourage that and, and what you're seeing is I think to a great extent in the university setting is you're seeing being worked out here in the west what was done in Russia where we're going to slowly over time redefine what different words mean or redefine concepts. At one point in this country, the idea was that you had equality, which is you know a good thing. Equality means that you all start at the same spot and it's up to you to be successful or be unsuccessful. Now we're talking about quote unquote equity, which is equality of outcome. That is anti-American, that's anti-Christian for one, um, not everybody ends up in the same place, and it's it's illogical to think that that could happen. Um, to criticize Christianity or to criticize America is to assume that utopia is a thing you can attain on this planet, which is absolutely false. Um, and, and in regards to what Michelle, at one point you mentioned Nietzsche. Nietzsche said that when, you know, that famous phrase, God is dead, was actually him making the point that if we remove God, we still have to have a moral standpoint. At least Nietzsche was smart enough to realize there had to be a moral backing to these different um, uh, academic changes that were being pushed even back in the 1800s. So I think, you know, we're now starting to really see the fruition of a society that has been based for a long time with no morals. So it's difficult for us to find a community because nobody wants to say anything because the entire system is now set up to identify you. And then if you don't agree with what the party says, you're gone. I, I think that what um, Michelle and EJ, what you guys offered are brilliant and true, like philosophical and sociological um, contributions to this question. I think on just a, like a relational level, um, there's a couple of key ingredients that community requires. And I wrote down just a couple of them, you know, proximity, you have to have some shared space, time, you have to actually invest time in community. Vulnerability is important. You have to actually be willing to uh, risk relationally. I do think there needs to be some kind of shared interest. And I would add probably for Christian community in particular, forgiveness and self-sacrifice. And those are all really tough values if you think about it. I mean, everybody's busy. You know, we, we're sort of isolated and independent. So that's hard to even be in proximity. The idea of being vulnerable means that you might be wounded. Um, probably the easiest thing is the shared interest. And then when you add things like self-sacrifice and forgiveness, you know, community is difficult. It's not easy, practical, practically. So you have all these things conspiring against you, right? You have the philosophical framework, you have the sociological difficulties, and then you just add the, the sort of practical interpersonal challenges. And it feels like there's a lot of pressure that is against good community. Yeah, I think good, good, um, good answers. As far as I was thinking, like anything that is worth our time, it actually involves um, for us to be able to invest our time. And relationships are not easy. Marriages, like for marriage, for example, is not easy. Many have like this idea, like, and they live happily ever after. Uh, but guess what? <laughs> For marriage, there is also like a lot of, like th do things with intentions. You need to go ahead and invest time. Um, you need to be willing to forgive and all the other things, self-sacrifice. So I think in a every relationship, if we were to think like that, um, indeed, it's like we put our heart out there. And no nowadays, I don't think not many uh, want to do that because we don't want to get wounded. But the other part I think is to add to all what you have said is like um, with this idea of we are very independent and let's add to all those things that you mentioned, um, 
this I, um, idea that we have that I think is uh, uh, in today's society, like we're able to make communities uh, somehow online. Like if we have um, in on Facebook or Instagram or any other social media, like we have friends when like in reality, none of like who can have a thousand friends? Come on, let's be real. Um, you know, um, can you invest at, um, your time in a thousand friends, in all of them, and have this intimacy that we're talking about? Uh, I don't, I don't think so. If someone is able to, let me know how you do it, <laughs> because um, I, I can, I cannot, and I don't know if any of you are able to. Um, so I think there is a, a different reason to why, uh, perhaps in today's environment, is difficult to. Um, it's hard to find a Christian community. Okay, so I let's think, go, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, real quick. I think you, you hit on a really important one there. I think in the internet age, we've settled for things that give a facade of community, but don't actually meet that deep need in the soul for real connection with people. Yeah. Well, and, and, and uh, to carry on from what you just pointed out there, Grady, I mean, I think part of it too is it goes along with everything else in our society and that we are in a society that is valuing instant gratification instead of deferred gratification. You know, we want the dopamine hit that we get from looking at our Facebook page and saying that we have a thousand friends without actually realizing that, you know, that's just a dopamine thing. There, There yeah. is no actual relationship there. Your brain's just geeking out because all of this stuff is designed to make dopamine be released and make you feel good about being on the app so that you spend more time on the app and then it turns into an addiction. It's not actually good for you with your mental health and certainly not good for you with your spiritual health. And I think that's one of the other issues is trying to form old fashioned communities is hard because people don't want to have to put the work in. Their brain is used to getting the reward without having to put the work in. Yeah. I don't um, Oh, Go sorry. Ahead, I was going to say, I was also going to say something about how, since we talked more about the philosophy, how that philosophy goes into politics, every political like view has a philosophical view in a sense. So right now we're seeing that with postmodernism, everything's up subjective, everything has to be secular, everything is has to be away from God. That means our politics, our policies on either campus or in a grander thing in our government is going to be influenced by that. Is that what we're seeing per, um, in, on campuses? We see persecution as, of Christians because it's like that doesn't go with the political view of that university. Oh, we're seeing maybe we might not see pro-life uh, social. I, I, would, I can only talk about in, in Canada. We don't, we're one of the only countries that in the world that does not have abortion laws, actual abortion laws. Like you can abort a baby like very late in term it's different from the united states but why is that because there's the, the philosophy is that a baby is a clump of cells that philosophy comes goes into that politics in which even in canada neither the conservatives or the liberals want to touch especially the conservatives which you would think that they have a large christian base they would and that'd be part of their philosophy but it isn't which is that's another thing that we're having here there's a blurred line when you get when you take God out of your philosophy, out of your worldview, your worldview suddenly comes of this world, of whatever the world is currently, in a sense. Yeah, I was thinking even when we were talking about community, um, the back on the days, I, I don't know, if, maybe I'm wrong, but back on the days they were saying that the nu nuclear, like the center of a community is the family. Um, and even family nowadays, <laughs> You know, uh, there is no longer a mom and a dad and the children. Now there can be like mom alone, dad alone, maybe two moms, maybe two dads and so on. So what God intended for good and the way that he goes about even, let's go ahead and talk about family and the family dynamics is no longer like it, it was meant to be. Um, so yes, I think it trickles down, unfortunately. So let's be cautious of what we're consuming and what social media you have, and maybe how much time you are investing on those things. 
Well, real quick, if I can apply that to the church as well, because I think that kind of dysfunction is present in the church as well, in the sense that people think that they can belong to a church community when they go to church twice a month. Mm -hmm. And all they do is they show up and they just, you know, consume a service for an hour and then they go back home. Or, you know, post pandemic, people claim that they belong to a church when all they do is they watch a video on Sunday morning that is a sermon. Right. And so you've seen the breakdown, not not only of the nuclear family, which is tragic, but the family that the community of Christ is supposed to be has also broken down. Um, and that's man, that's gut wrenching. I, I would even add on to that. It's that it's getting even more. I can only talk about where I live in the province I live that they stated we've been in that you have to register for church. And oh, Lord. He, um, yeah, and at, uh, we don't have full capacity. So here in Ontario, you have only 50%, I, I might be butchering this, but 50% capacity of social distancing, wearing masks and everything. They introduced yesterday a legislation that if churches want full capacity, they need to show proof of vaccine. Their congregation has to show proof of vaccination. If somebody's unvaccinated, they cannot enter the church. If, you, if, if they can enter the church, but it'll be 50% capacity. So now we're, we're seeing more of a deterioration of the Christian community because now we're going to be seeing which churches are going to be discriminated against people who are not vaccinated and who is and where and for other some people, maybe they've been at the church for many years, decades, and maybe for a personal choice, a medical choice, they won't be able to go to their, their, church, their church. Which and is there, there's, part. There's something really insidious about that because the way that you destroy an individual is you isolate them from community. Well, Satan, think, Satan knows that too. Sorry, on a spiritual level. I mean, this is one yeah. of the reasons why community is so important for Christians because, and I've got an illustration of that, but maybe I'll save it for later, but go ahead, EJ. What were you going to say? Well, it just, you know, we are all designed by God. And one of the things God has designed in us is that, you know, as you've just said, we are by our nature social creatures we are not like other you know creatures on this earth that can survive alone you know we need you know to be together there's that famous um example from the 60s of a young girl that her parents kept her chained to a chair um for the first 16 17 years of her life the only human interaction she got was her mother bringing in food and cleaning her and she couldn't speak, she couldn't walk, she couldn't, I mean, honest to goodness, this person was 16, but had about a two-year-old's level of thinking. That is how important interaction with other human beings is, especially in, a, in the younger ages. And when it comes to this, you know, with all these kids that are going through this stuff right now, it will seriously impact their mental health because as we go on with this, if they're not in the church, and they're not getting community in the church, these young kids, well, they don't then have a frame of reference for when they get older. And, you know, that's just going to cause more problems down the road for a lot of the kids in the church that aren't going to be allowed in. Because some of these kids are so young, they can't get vaccinated. So then if, you know, in Canada, it sounds like they won't be allowed in the church at all. It's for, uh, at the moment, it's for people who are 12, and over so like teenagers might some teenagers might not be getting involved but they're trying to approve it for five to 11 year olds at the moment so yeah we'll and even when we talk about the church i just want to be sure like we even define that <laughs> it's, especially in today's environment like the church um body of believers versus the church um the building where we gather okay so let's make that um yeah the definition so therefore i think like the church as a body of believers I think we um, may the Lord in this case give wisdom to the people and may the Holy Spirit guide accordingly. So then the um, there's no forsaking of the gathering of believers. No, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead and move into the next question. What Christian communities are you currently part of? And well, let me add another close. question close to that. Um, so you can ask two at one is like, uh, what um, Christian community are you currently part of? And how is that you find them? Okay. Uh, 
uh, I can start. Yes, go for it. Uh, so first, Trinity, that's one of the things I do. Uh, I get mentored once a week. And yep, for it's not even an hour, I would say like two to three hours at a time. Because uh, me and my mentor, we're, we love to talk and say anything and do our Bible study. I also do an online Bible study with my, my friends. I do, I go to church on Sunday. And I started doing um, hymn singing every Friday night with a bunch of young people from different types of churches. How did I find all these things? Surprisingly, during the pandemic online. <laughs> and which... Uh, I was looking for a new church, and I found the church I did find, uh, Trinity. I was in a, a bad place at the time last year. Well, yeah, a year, year and a half ago before the pandemic, and I just, uh, yeah, I just ended up fi- surprisingly finding Trinity on Instagram. I don't know how. I don't know when, but I did, and now I'm here. And through the church that I was going to, I was able to connect make friends and through there I was able to do the hymn singing and create bible study with a new uh, form of friends that are all Christian thank you Michelle well I guess I can go next then um so of course Trinity as well for myself still kind of excited from our actual getting to meet each other in person couple weeks ago down there in Kentucky that was that was really great I I was brought in <clears throat> when Mayor me was putting this all together uh, back in 29 spring of 2019 because um, I had known her from um, an RZIM summer conference that she and I had both attended and she literally just like called me up one night and was like hey I'm doing this thing do you want to be involved and I was like well, yeah, I'm not going to pass that offer up at all. Like, that's got to happen. So that that was how I got involved with uh, Trinity. And then I've got my church that I've been going to uh, for the last three or four years. Good friend of mine, I was kind of looking for a new church. And he was like, hey, you should come with me and my wife. And I was like, cool. And I, I grew up around this church, so I grew up pretty well anyway. So I went and then... Uh, when we have our uh, small group Bible study on Tuesday nights, and then occasionally when I can make it, I go with my dad to a men's Bible study with a bunch of guys from different churches on Monday nights. So it's all just about, you know, where you're at trying to figure out who's a, who's on the same wavelength as we are and uh, getting involved that way. Real quick, Monica, are we going to talk about the question like finding Christian community? Are we getting to that or is this a good place for me to inject some of that? Okay, well, then I'll hold off on that. Um, I mean, I would say to anybody listening to this, if you are not involved in a church, you absolutely need to get involved in a church. Um, You know, Trinity is amazing. And I think that uh, in the world that we live in today that's oriented around technology and where you've got people who leave their hometown to go to university somewhere, this is an incredible opportunity for you to find some community digitally that can minister to you and encourage you and pray for you. So I highly encourage if you're watching this and you're not involved in Trinity, definitely check out what Trinity does. I mean, for me personally, though, being a pastor of a church, I mean, most of my community, I I would say actually all of my community is centered around that. So I attend a Tuesday morning men's Bible study Every other week we get together with what we call our family church. And it's like six families that meet in our house and we encourage one another. We pray for one another. I'm involved with a couple of pastors and we get together once a month and we do lunch together and we just talk about ministry and we look at scripture together. Um, So, I mean, the vast majority, I mean, this is just my professional life too. So the vast majority of my community comes to me through church uh, but I, but I think that if you have experienced the beauty of what the church family can be, then uh, as a Christian, you would agree that that is the central place to find uh, like-minded people who are moving towards Jesus, who will care for you and be concerned about the state of your soul. Um, at least if it's being done right, that's how it should be. 
Yeah, well, I'm glad that you are all part of um, a Christian community, or I would like to say fellowship. Um, I think that's a better word. Uh, so fellowship, because fellowship is is really amazing, and I trust that God allows for us to to find um, the the fellowships that we're part of. Um, in your case, Michelle, um, you know, like how is that you even became part of Trinity? I don't believe in coincidences nor in luck. No. So I trust that God in his immense grace and love towards us, his children, he provides. And he provides at the right time um, and the right, pe the right people as well. So praise God for his good. Um, so the next question is, uh, what does a Christian miss when they are not in community with fellow believers? Uh, what are the benefits and what are the stakes involved? I think um, Grady mentioned a little bit of that at the very beginning. And so, um, and then after that, if we can answer like, how is that someone can find a Christian community, especially someone that maybe is on campus right now is feeling lonely um, or things of that nature. Um, so if you can, I remember a couple of years ago uh, watching this nature documentary and in this documentary um, you had these elephants at nighttime and they were being hunted by these lions and the way the elephants survived this sort of onslaught from the lions was they would kind of circle up together with their you know faces out so they could watch what was going on and they would they would huddle up together and the lions had this really uh vicious way of circling and roaring and scaring until one of the elephants would get so spooked that it would take off from the group. And as soon as that happened, you know, that elephant was dinner. Um, and, and that has always really impressed my mind of the need for being involved in community. What happens when somebody is not connected to, I would say in particular, a Christian? Well, the Bible says that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And if you're isolated and you're alone, you are far more vulnerable to those kinds of attacks. Things like loneliness and depression, which are rampant in our culture today. Um, you know, isolation, you fall into maybe temptation and sin that uh, distracts you from your pursuit of Jesus. So what do you miss? Well, you, you become an island to yourself and you just can't survive like that. Like EJ was saying before, we're social creatures. So I think, I, I, I feel like that's a pretty good illustration of the dangers of the isolation. <clears throat> well, I, I think I'd, I'd like to add on to that, you know, <laughs> going back six years now, one of the things that Mayor Zemi and I talked about um, all the way back at that RZIM conference, which you know, I, I think from what she said, kind of spurred on the creation of Trinity a little bit. But one of the things I told her was, you know, we as Christians, I think one of the really great analogies that's used throughout the Bible is us as soldiers in the army of God, especially at the time those analogies were made. And, and even before then, the example I used was the Greek phalanx, which is kind of what Grady's talking about with elephants here. But um and the phalanx, they were famous for not being broken. It was very difficult to break uh, a phalanx. And what you would do is you'd have these row of men and each man had this giant, I mean, giant shield that's oak shield covered over in, in bronze, all this sort of thing. And when they would form the line, your shield didn't really cover you. Your shield um, covered the left flank of the man next to you and so on and so on down the line. And the men behind you had their shields and they would push you forward, right? And it was generally well known that if you could break the phalanx, a Greek soldier in and of himself was uh, pretty much worthless. He, he did not have maneuverability, he was clunky, he was you know, just kind of stuck out in the middle of the battle. So that's the importance here is that you know, we cover each other. Um, you know, we make sure that we're walking rightly. We make sure that we're, you know, you know, Monica, if you notice that I'm slipping up and saying things that I shouldn't say, you know, like, hey, 
you're saying things you shouldn't say or like i noticed that grady's like participating in behavior he shouldn't be participating in hey look you know you don't want to do that because that's the enemy trying to drag you out of where we're supposed to be here and I think that's the importance is to be effective as soldiers in the army of God. We have to depend on each other. We can't do it by ourselves. Carrying out the task is so monumental it can't be done on your own. Yeah, I would just add, yeah, I just add on that like I think accountability is pretty good if, if you don't have that, as as EJ said. But as well, it's like you don't grow as much spiritually if you don't have a community. Um for like I'll just use myself personally that like I've been a Christian for the past eight years since like 20 2013 but I because I was in and out of community Christian communities and isolated even if I went I went to a Christian university but I still felt isolated in a Christian university Hmm. but which is kind of sad you should you kind of think that it wasn't until like the past year and a half that I've actually like grown spiritually actually um I think my mentor can, can say that like, oh yeah, Michelle's changed a lot. I don't see it, but other people say see it that yeah, Michelle's changed a lot since like the past year and a half since I've actually been being more involved, being more like um how st- had being more involved in the community, being more more kind of having that accountability from other Christian people about like either what I'm doing or or anything else. And in like in the same thing well, I'd be able to like give people accountability as well to their actions and maybe they don't see it it's just and if they don't see what I, I don't see what I'm doing too and I think that's helped me grow a lot and try I think changed a lot from there too yes so if you're not a part of a fellowship of believers then you're missing accountability you're missing an opportunity to grow in your faith you're missing uh, what Grady mentioned is like others kind of coming alongside you And oh my gosh, if ever we have a time to talk, um, I have experienced like so many, some like super difficult situations as a family and as an individual. (laughs) And praise God for for the body of believers that come alongside, that are willing to pray for you, that are willing to encourage you. And you know what what the word uses like as judgmental, or they are like, how dare can someone tell you what what or why you're doing whatever you're doing we actually are grateful for those um, voices that are telling us hey be careful what you're doing it is dangerous uh, don't go that way because that way actually leads to more brokenness uh, so praise god for uh, fellowship and people who are willing to invest in your life and it's not because of a check mark it's not because god is in, kind of giving us brownie points and then he's going to love us more. No, it's out of the love that God has already given up, uh, given to us and we're able to go ahead and extend that to others. Um, so let's go ahead and answer this question. Uh, what could we, and that is each of you, do better to build up the particular uh, conservative Christian community and please, if you remember to answer also, how is that someone can find a Christian community or a fellowship of believers? If, if I can uh, take this one first, because I, I think that um, as a pastor, I hear people say quite often, you know, I'm, I'm frustrated with my church because I feel like nobody seeks me out. Nobody... Um, you know, nobody builds a relationship with me. Nobody says hi, those kinds of things. And I mean, this is just narcissism. <laughs> if you lack community and you want community, be the initiator, uh, take the risk, um, be the first person who builds a relationship with somebody, be the person who crosses the room or who reaches out, who makes that phone call, who makes the invitation. Um, If you're sitting around waiting for somebody to invite you into their home, why don't you invite them into your home? Um, So I think that a lot of people are disaffected and displeased with the state of their community, but they're still waiting for other people to take the initiative. And if you really want to find community, then be the person who puts themselves out there, take the risk. Um, and, And I think that you'll find reward in that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, in the church, it's important that we're 
we're looking out for that and we're trying to to initiate that but i think especially for a lot of our membership that's on the university campus that's in high school that mm -hmm. is um in these different places where you do genuinely feel isolated because everybody's going out and you know pardon me but they're drinking doing drugs and having sex on the weekends and all that sort of thing and you're of course not wanting to be in that behavior it's really hard to find somebody that's not doing that the best thing and this is what i found worked for me is you got to keep your ear to the ground and kind of listen to what different people say for example um, in my undergrad i was very concerned that i would have or that I would not be able to find a professor to be my faculty mentor that thought the way I did. You know, most of the faculty members were very, very leftist. Um, most of them were very either agnostic or atheist. So I'm like, I got to find somebody that's a conservative and a Christian, which is going to be kind of a monumental task. But I started listening to the different faculty members and just listen to what they say. Don't talk. Just listen to how people say things. And, and this is also something you have to pray about. You've got to pray that you're going to find these people. But I wound up finding the only conservative Christian faculty guy in my field of study on our campus. And I said, hey, would you be my faculty mentor? And he said, yeah. And, and we had a really great relationship. He helped me quite a lot. But it's the, the key that I think is when you're in those environments, and you're concerned about speaking out and you being ridiculed or you know outed as a Christian conservative, mm -hmm. keep your ear to the ground because there are plenty of faculty that think the way you do. There are plenty of other students who think the way you do. I found you know a few really good friends during my undergrad because I listened to how they would say things. And I think it's, you know. I think Michelle, maybe you said earlier, you know, you're the stereotypical Christian or something to that effect that people know you're a Christian just by the way you act, right? Listen for that. You know what it sounds like. I know what it sounds like. Listen for that. And there'll be somebody pray about it and God will guide you there. That's really good, EJ. I, I would um, connect to that too. This idea that if fellowship is our shared connection to Christ, then expand your definition of who you can have fellowship with, right? Did you find that you actually had some fellowship with this professor, even though he was, you know, you sought him out because he was primarily going to be your advisor? Oh, yeah, there, well, <laughs> one, of, one of the best things I can I, I'd say about this gentleman is uh, we were sitting in his office and I was talking about wanting to go to grad school. And he gave me a piece of advice that I'll never forget. He said, um, because we knew each other pretty well. And, and he would allow me to write the way I thought instead of a lot of other professors that want to tailor your writing to the way they think. I'll never forget. He told me one time, he said, look, you got to promise me one thing, son. I said, okay, he's called me son. That's a little different. I said, yes, sir. He goes, when you go to grad school, keep your mouth shut. I said, what do you mean, doc? He goes, I know you well enough to know that you talk way too much. And he said, when you go to grad school, you won't get a graduate degree if you don't keep your mouth shut. So he said, keep your mouth shut until you get the degree. And then when you get the degree, you can say whatever the heck you want. But he said, you know, that is the key. And then those sort of things where I'd be able to go into his office and he would give me advice or he would he would speak to me more in the way that, you know, my dad might speak to me than um, than a professor, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And what I was pointing at is like, if you're on a secular college university, if you find a church nearby, that's a good, solid, biblical, biblically faithful church, you might not find any other college students there. That's possible. But this, this is what I'm getting is expand your definition of what fellowship means, because you might find an old retired couple that would love to have you over on a Friday night when all the other college kids are out partying, getting wasted. And they would love to just pour on you, have you over for dinner and encourage you and pray for you. Um, so you, you might be surprised that your definition of what fellowship could look like is, is too narrow. It doesn't necessarily need to be just people of the same age group or same demographic that you're part of. I, well, I, I was, I'm sorry. I was no, gonna, well, go um, ahead. 
I was totally going to agree. Like when I was in undergrad, I felt isolated. But as I said, I went to a Christian university for my undergrad and I went to a secular for my graduate but degree. But for undergrad, I felt isolated in a sense. I didn't, I, I would try to fit in with the young people. And I, I couldn't because it was just like, I knew that maybe for them, like the Holy Spirit, like they were maybe forced to come to Christian university because the parents are Christian. They told them to. Me, I wanted to go to it because I, I was like, I want a Christian education. I never got one. So I want one. So for me, it was like, where did I get all my connections? All my connections were for fellowship or outside of the university. They were at a church I went to, which mm-hmm. it was all, the church was all elderly people are all under the age of nine. <laughs> I was the only young person. <laughs> so I would go Thanksgiving to their house. I would go to some of the older people's houses. I would do Christmas at their house. I do Friday nights with them. I, it's, that's what I would do. And after from there, or until now, I'm actually finding yeah, people around my age I can fellowship with. It takes takes time to find those people. It's not You're not going to find it overnight. But yeah, yeah, as you're saying, don't discriminate against somebody's age. I think it's actually a bonus having somebody who's older than you and very deep in their faith because you actually can learn from what they did when they were younger or what and stuff like that too. Yeah, let's remember in the body of Christ, um, the age kind of melts away, <laughs> remember? Yeah. If not, check like minute five <laughs> of this conversation. Um, EJ, were you going to add something else to that? Well, I was just going to say, I, I, I like Grady. I like your point about expanding your idea. But, you know, one of the things, one of the, some of the best memories I have from my, um, my undergrad was actually when I was a manager at one of the jobs I worked on campus. And we worked night shift. And um, I started to get pretty close to some of my my employees, and um, some of them, you know, were conservative Christians. Some of them were um, just conservative. Some of them weren't either one. But we had this tradition where, instead of in the town that I went to school, the only places that were open past ten o'clock in the evening were either strip clubs, bars, or the Jolly Pirate Donut Shop. So instead <laughs> of clubs or the bars we would all go i started this thing where we would go to jolly pirate and we'd be at jolly pirate donuts until two or three in the morning sharing stories and it it turned out i could fellowship with some of them and then it turned into a little bit of a missions field we could witness to some of the ones that you know weren't in agreement with some of our stuff but it's that whole keeping your ear to the ground listening to what people say and figuring out who you can have a conversation with who agrees you know who's the believer who isn't a believer but who's open to it it's this whole it's a whole dynamic of getting to learn how to read people almost in a way yeah well yes i think um from what you guys just said we need to be the initiators and find a local church, a biblical church, be sure that it's like doctrinally sound. Uh, Also check trusted advisors, um, maybe from home, Uh, maybe some people around that you truly, um, how do you say, trust, ask them questions. Maybe they have, they know people around. And um, I appreciate what uh, many of you said, like expand your idea as far as fellowship. It doesn't mean like, because I am 42 years old, I only hang out with the 42 years old ladies, that's it. I don't talk to nobody else. Um, it doesn't work like that in the body of Christ. Thank you so much. And before closing today's conversation, and I know we can go for hours upon hours of talking, um, closing remarks. Is there anything that you want to stress out? Is there something else that you want to tell that um, student? Um, or a scholar that is on campus right now, maybe feeling lonely, isolated, um, having this idea like, oh, I so wish for a community. Um, Any closing remarks? Uh, I can go first. So I started Trinity as a grad student, a lonely, lonely grad student, which I was legitimately the only Christian in my whole cohort for my grad school. I would not have passed grad school. I would not have been a strong grad school if I didn't join Trinity and I did a mentorship every week. It was one of the best decisions I've ever done. And I think that if you are a grad student, an undergrad student on a secular campus, or even a Christian campus that you may not find be able to find somebody that you can connect with, try Trinity. I think it helps for like, I, it helps for so many things, learning the Bible actually, and learning, having advice too. Like you have somebody who's has the same 
Christian worldview as you, and you can get advice off of them how to like socialize better, how to connect better, how how where you can connect. I think it's pretty good. Uh, the, the missionary William Carey said, um, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. And I would encourage you to understand that God actually wants fellowship for you. His word says that he longs for you to be part of his body. And so be bold, knowing that because God wants that for you, he will provide it. But you have mm -hmm. some uh, responsibility to take initiative and to risk and to go looking for it, but he will provide it. I think the most important thing with your Christian community is, you know, it's a fool who doesn't learn from somebody else's mistakes. And that's the biggest thing I found in the church, in the Bible studies, is how many times I'm able to share with somebody, hey, I made this mistake. So, you really want to watch going down that path because you'll make that same mistake too or somebody looks at me and goes hey pal like you're going to make that same mistake i think that's the biggest thing is it it really helps to mitigate ac accidents in the sense of making bad decisions or you know getting you know into bad thinking patterns stuff like that because you know everybody you know depending on where you're at those that are older than you have already made those mistakes and they can help you you know, nobody's perfect. And I think that's the great thing is you can learn from each other. And it's kind of reassuring because you're like, wow, I'm not a terrible person because I thought this or, wow, I'm not a moron because I did this. Everybody does it. So in that community, you can learn from each other that way. I think that's the best, best thing. Yes, well, thank you so much to each, each of you for uh, being part of today's roundtable. Let's remember that if you are not a member of Trinity yet, you can be one. Um, be sure to check the links. I will imagine they're going to be below somewhere. Also, there is going to be, or we have some good material, sometimes articles or why not. So that will be a good way to connect. If you are seeking for a mentor, uh, this is a good space as well. If you want to be a mentor, um, maybe you are like solid in your faith. Um, you want to pour into someone else. We have opportunities for that as well. And may uh, our desire for each of us that are here today um, to have one um, passion and that is to seek Christ, um, to be good representative of who he is in the way that we do our life um, in, when we're alone and also when we, wherever we go. Um, thank you so much and looking forward to connect with you um, in another time in another conversation.